Welcome back to the Bone Physiology Playlist. In the last video, we talked about a special cell that was located around the bone, and it biosynthesizes collagen for the bone, and it also synthesizes a crystalline structure called hydroxyapatite, which gives bone its characteristic hardness. And so what we said is that osteoblasts build the bone. But in this video, we're going to talk about a different kind of cell, and this cell is called an osteoclast. Okay, now in the very first video in this playlist, we talked about the lineage of all these different kinds of cells that are inside or around the bone. And osteoclasts are derived ultimately from immune cells. So what we have essentially are specialized macrophages. A macrophage is a phagocyte, an immune type of cell. And basically they are going to essentially be converted into osteoclasts once they take up residence in the bone tissue. And essentially what osteoclasts are, they are catabolic cells. So let me write that down. Osteoclasts are catabolic cells. You may even think the C in osteoclast, it was a B in osteoblast, right? But the C is for catabolic. And the reason I say they are catabolic is they have several enzymes associated with them that digest or break down the bone. Okay, so these, these catabolize these catabolize bone. And what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about um, several mechanisms by which they do this. But before we go into the mechanisms of these, I want to first kind of orient you with the structure of an osteoclast. So this down here, this, this cell right here is called an osteoclast. Okay, And there are several important structural things about it. Number one, when you look at it, um, very close up, it, it appears very much like a jellyfish almost, where you have this kind of hemispheric top to it. Okay, let me find the mouse. You have this hemispheric top up here, and then on the other side of it, there's something called the ruffled border, and the ruffled border over here has several enzymes in it that process the bone and catabolize it. Okay, um, what we also have here, and let me kind of highlight this just so you can kind of see it, this over here, this is essentially the wall of the bone on which the osteoclast is acting, okay? And there's this area kind of in here, this area between the osteoclast and the bone itself. And this is called the resorptive pit, okay? And all the resorptive pit is, is it's just a, a place in space between the osteoclast and the bone. And this is where the osteoclast will process the bone and break it down. It's sort of, if you if you maybe did an analogy of an enzyme and an active site, you could say the enzyme would be the osteoclast and the active site is the resorptive pit. This is just the place where all the action is going to take place. Okay. Um, also located on the bone itself, we have these proteins. Let me circle this one. There's a protein here. There's some other ones similar to it. But this protein right here, this is a protein called osteopontin, and there's some other ones like this. And these proteins, as we'll talk about later, are phosphoproteins, meaning they have phosphates on them. And it turns out that there's a point on the osteoclast. Let me do this in blue. This point right here on the osteoclast, okay, there's one there, there's another one here. And this point is called the sealing zone, and it turns out that an area around the sealing zone likes to hook onto those phosphates of the osteopontin. Okay, and this is actually the mechanism by which the osteoclast literally attaches itself to the bone. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And then out of the ruffled border right here, out of the ruffled border in this region, this is essentially where the enzymes are going to act on the bone. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of structural information about the osteoclast and just kind of a little joke here. If anyone's ever played uh, either like Smash Bros. Brawl or any of those games that involve Samus or Ron, um, kind of the way I think about osteoclasts is they're sort of like those Metroids or those Metroids from the game because they kind of look like jellyfish when you look at them up really close. Okay, anyways. Okay, so what are some mechanisms by which the osteoclast breaks down bone? Well, if you think about it, there are really two things that the osteoclast has to break down. Number one, it has to break down collagen. 
And it turns out that because collagen is a protein, it's going to require proteases in order to break it down because proteases break down proteins. The other thing that the osteoclast has to worry about is what we looked at the synthesis of in the last video, which is hydroxyapatite. So the osteoclast has to have a mechanism to break down this crystalline calcified structure in the, bro in the bone. And one of the ways it's going to do that is what we're going to talk about on this slide, and that is acid, meaning we have a low pH. And if we're looking at this on a molecular level, we're talking about hydrogen ions. And it turns out that there's, in general, two ways this occurs. Okay, number one, the minor way, is we have this enzyme that we talked about. We actually talked about it in osteoblast function, but it turns out there's another function of it here in the osteoclast. When you actually look at the net reaction of carbonic anhydrase, it looks something like this. So what we're going to have is carbon dioxide, we're going to have water, and then we're going to put those together through the action of carbonic anhydrase, and we're going to get something called carbonic acid and then that's going to quickly dissociate into bicarbonate HCO3- and H+. And so some of the hydrogen ions that we're getting are actually coming from this reaction. But there actually is another mechanism by which this occurs which is the major way. And that's actually by using something called a vacuolar ATPase. And the vacuolar ATPase allows for the proton generation and the protons are pumped into the resorptive pit. Okay, so the ATPase takes the protons and pumps them into the resorptive pit. So this area kind of in here between the osteoclast and the bone itself, this area is essentially going to fill up with hydrogen ions. Okay, it's going to fill up with hydrogen ions. And so the hydrogen ions are actually going to react with the things in the hydroxyapatite. Okay, so if you think back to what hydroxyapatite is, I'll kind of write over it here, but essentially what it is, is it's going to be calcium 10, it's going to be PO4, and there's going to be six of those, I hope I'm doing this right, and then OH2, and this right here, this is the molecular formula for hydroxyapatite. And so what ends up happening is when, when hydrogen ions react with this, number one, the calcium is released, okay but the phosphate becomes protonated and so you get you get phosphoric acid with all the acid in there um the hydroxide will essentially become h2o right and then all of the carbonate or the bicarbonate that's left over from the carbonic anhydrase reaction it will get protonated to form carbonic acid Okay, so the acid, what it's going to do is it's going to take specifically, let me highlight these, it's going to take these two components right here, which are the hydroxide and the phosphate, and it's going to protonate them fully, and that causes the hydroxyapatite crystalline structure to fall apart. And once the phosphate and hydroxide become uh, released from the, the matrix of the bone, you get free calcium that's released. And so that's how acid does this. It reacts with the hydroxyapatite and basically protonates everything. Also, osteoclasts have a high number of lysosomes. And we also talked about lysosomes when we looked at the previous exam's material. And we know lysosomes do several things. Number one, lysosomes, remember, they also have acid. So it turns out that some of the acid that we talked about here is actually generated through the lysosome because lysosomes have a pH around 3. And then we take that acid, the protons, and pump them into the resorptive pit through the vacuolar ATPase. So you have acid. You also have synthesis of reactive oxidative species. And then you're also going to have proteases. Okay. And so what might the proteases be used for? Well, one use of them might be to degrade collagen because collagen itself is a protein. And if you're going to degrade bone, you can't just degrade the hydroxyapatite. You also have to degrade collagen. If you remember back to our study of reactive oxidative species, one of the main ones we're concerned about 
is the hydroxyl radical. Of course, we also have hydrogen peroxide, which is a little bit less dangerous. Certainly, hydroxyl radicals are the most dangerous. But those can essentially oxidize proteins and make them more prone to destruction. Okay, so the acid will essentially degrade the hydroxy appetite. Also, acid denatures these proteins to some extent. The reactive oxidative species damage the protein, and then ultimately the proteases are going to cleave the proteins apart. And all of these things are allowed basically because the osteoclast has lysosomes, one of our favorite little organelles. Um, two specific enzymes that we're really concerned with with lysosomes are called cathepsin K, and there's another one called matrix metalloproteinase. Now, cathepsin K is very important. If you're looking at this from a biological or biochemical standpoint, cathepsin K is a cysteine protease. Okay? Um, one of the other types of cysteine proteases are, are caspases, which we mentioned in a previous video. But this is specifically the protein that targets collagen for destruction okay so we have a way to synthesize the collagen and when we don't need it anymore one of the enzymes that's able to degrade it is called cathepsin k okay so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense there's also some other proteins that exist in the extracellular matrix of bone okay and one of them that's able to have a little bit broader of a specificity is called matrix metalloproteinase and i just abbreviate it here as metalloproteinase this digests proteins of the extracellular matrix of the bone, but its exact function in osteoclast has not been elucidated. Most likely what it's doing is just degrading some of the other auxiliary proteins um, other than collagen. Certainly, cathepsin K is the main one that degrades collagen. And so what you need to know for the, the osteoclast function is that you get production of acid, you get production of reactive oxidative species, with, which damage proteins. You have these proteases, cathepsin K, of which degrades collagen, and matrix metalloproteinase degrades other stuff. And hopefully you understand that all of this catalysis is really taking place in this resorptive pit. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. If we move on to um, one mechanism by which the osteoclast is able to generate reactive oxidative species, what we're essentially looking at is a very important enzyme in osteoclast function called tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase. But in this class, you're more likely to refer, here to refer to as TRAP. Understand this is tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase. Okay. And, and this is something that I mentioned at the very beginning of the, video, beginning of the video. We have these proteins here that are located on the bone. I'm circling it in red, or let me highlight it. And these proteins, in general, are called osteopontin. Okay, there is an osteopontin. Certainly there is another one over here. And if you actually look at osteopontin, what it is, is it's a, it's a protein, but it's a phosphoprotein. So what you'll actually see on it, is you will see a phosphate group. And you'd actually have to go look into the research to figure out what residue this phosphate is attached to. But suffice to say, there's a phosphate. Okay, And actually, what the osteoclast does is the sealing zone, I'll do that in blue, the sealing zone of the osteoclast actually looks for the phosphate. The osteoclast looks for this phosphate on a specific residue, and it actually binds to it. Okay, so let me illustrate that over here. This is a phosphate on the osteopontin, right? And then the osteoclast, using part of the sealing zone, right, it specifically targets that phosphoprotein for binding. And this is the mechanism by which the osteoclast will bind, okay? Now, something very important happens here, okay? One function of the tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase is to use something referred to as a redox iron. And this is where iron starts out in the 2 plus oxidation state. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you exactly what happens there. And actually, it's, it's to some extent elucidated here. This should actually be O2 minus like that. And so ultimately, through the reactions that we've seen so far, we can take molecular oxygen. So this is the Lewis structure for molecular oxygen, and we can use something referred to as this enzyme number one, NADPH phagosome oxidase, and we can essentially reduce molecular oxygen into superoxide. So notice we just added an electron here. This is called 
superoxide. And then we can use superoxide dismutase, superoxide dismutase, which is this enzyme number two. This can convert superoxide into hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, which is dangerous in and of itself. Okay. Now, what can also happen is if I have this hydrogen peroxide, okay, and then I also have this redox iron that's part of tartrate resistant acid phosphatase, specifically it's iron in the two plus state, okay, and keep in mind there is an electron out here, right? What can happen is the tartrate resistant acid phosphatase redox iron can actually, it can transfer an electron, this electron, onto this oxygen, and that effectively is going to cleave this bond. And so what you end up with after this reaction is a hydroxide, and then you also end up with a hydroxyl radical, okay? And these guys are particularly dangerous, and it's actually one mechanism by which the osteoclast will destroy the bone extracellular matrix, in particular the proteins that are in there. And so then I think you have an intuition that once I do this, I also end up with, I still have the iron there, but then it's in the three plus oxidation state and I have to have some way to get it back to the two plus oxidation state. And actually the way that I do that is essentially using this reaction shown here. This is the second one that's shown in this list. I'm actually going to take that another one superoxide that I make. Let me draw another superoxide. So there's one superoxide. And then what I can do is I can take maybe this electron right here, one of these electrons, and I can actually transfer that electron onto the iron in the three plus state. And number one, it regenerates iron in the two plus state because the iron's getting reduced. And then you also end up with one other molecular oxygen. And so basically what that means is that through these reactive oxidative species synthesizing enzymes, the tartrate resistant acid phosphatase is actually self-reliant in this case. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And that can only happen when the osteoclast is bound to those phosphoproteins referred to as osteopontin. Okay, and keep in mind that, that, that catalysis is occurring in here. Okay, but something interesting is going to happen after a while. Okay, and again, this mechanism is not super well elucidated, but what's going to happen is, is over a period of time, usually a very short period of time, the enzyme tartrate resistant acid phosphatase, this one right here, it's going to dephosphorylate the phosphoproteins. Okay? In other words, it's going to cleave that bond and it's going to cleave this bond. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you kind of a pictorial representation of what's happening. Okay, so let's let's say that this is the osteopontin. These are osteopontins and I have phosphates right here. That's my phosphate. And then I have the osteoclast. Here's the osteoclast that's bound on there, right? Osteoclast is right there. And let's say I have my tartrate resistant acid phosphatase here. Here's tartrate resistant acid phosphatase, okay? And this is the osteoclast. Well, you know, keep in mind that the tartrate resistant acid phosphatase is synthesizing reactive oxidative species. Those are, you know, de degrading the bone and so forth. Well, over a series of very short periods of time, this phosphate is going to be cleaved off. And the reason it does that is because of this enzyme. It's a phosphatase. So it cleaves off phosphates. Okay, but fortunately it doesn't do it initially. Okay, it'll synthesize some ROS first and then over a period of time it will hydrolyze off the phosphates. So now what you'll have is you'll still have these osteopontins, okay, but their phosphates float away. So you'll have some number N of phosphates, right? It'll float away. And so now, you know, I think you understand if the osteopontin is not phosphorylated, there's really no reason for the osteoclast to, to stay associated with them. So the osteoclast will sort of float away. Because the osteopontin is not phosphorylated, now the osteoclast can't stick onto it. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. But the osteoclast sort of floats away, and it's moving along the bone, and then let's say it comes across another 
another series of osteopontins. So these are phosphorylated. And then what can happen is, once again, this osteoclast, it might be floating around, and then it says, hey, here's some osteopontins in the phosphorylated state, and it will come and it will associate with these. And so what you'll get at the end of this is I'll draw my osteopontins. Here are my phosphates, right? Here's my phosphates. And then once again, I'll have my osteoclast that will like to stick on to the phosphates. And then the cycle is just going to repeat itself. The osteoclast likes those phosphates on osteopontin. It's going to, you know, use tartrate resistant acid phosphatase. It's going to generate more reactive oxidative species and so forth. And this cycle keeps repeating itself. Once it's done with that, TRAP is going to dephosphorylate osteopontin, and then it's just going to float away and move on to the next series of osteopontins. And this cycle just repeats itself until the osteoclast has really moved all over the bone and degraded a lot of it. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Let's test ourselves. Okay, The component of the osteoclast that binds the phosphoosteopontin on the bone is what? Well, we can certainly look at this picture right here, and we see this right here. This is the osteopontin. There's another osteopontin. It's a phosphoprotein. And what component of the osteoclast binds there? Well, it appears to be the sealing zone, right? The sealing zone of the osteoclast specifically targets the amino acid with the phosphate on it of osteopontin. So the answer here is the sealing zone, okay? Keep in mind the ruffled border, this is basically where the enzymes are that are going to degrade the bone. And also one other thing I do want to mention about the ruffled border, notice that because the border is ruffled, you have an increased, you have an increased surface area for catalysis, right? There's an increased surface area so you can actually fit more enzymes in there. So if you have more enzymes, you have increased catalysis versus if this was just flat, right? If you have this ruffled border, there's more surface area for reactions to take place on, and so you actually speed it up drastically. And actually, this kind of strategy of increasing surface area, this is actually used all over the body. In fact, we'll get to one example this semester when we talk about the brain. The cerebral cortex of the brain, if you've ever seen a brain, it's all kind of grooves in it. Those are called gyri and sulci. And basically, you increase the surface area of the brain so that there's basically more neurons and so forth. And so it basically, for all intents and purposes, makes you smarter than organisms that might have less gyri and sulci on the brain. So increased surface area increases the ability for catalysis. This is also used in the digestive system in the duodenum. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. More surface area, more catalysis. Let's go to the next one. The enzyme that digests collagen is what? Well, the enzyme that digests collagen is, it was cathepsin K, right? This was our cysteine protease that is going to target collagen for destruction. What about the enzyme that releases free radicals? Well, the one that directly does it is tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase. Remember, it has that redox iron that gives it the capacity to synthesize those reactive oxidative species. The enzyme that releases the osteoclast from osteopontin is what? Well, if you remember, tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase also has another function. It's a phosphatase. So it's evil, able to cleave the phosphate off of the osteopontin. And so tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase also uh, is a phosphatase that releases the osteoclast from that protein. What about the enzyme that digests general proteins in the matrix? Well, that one, let's see, is not actually listed here. That particular enzyme, remember, this D, this is matrix, matrix metallo, matrix metalloproteinase. Okay, you can go, but certainly go back to some of the previous slides and, and take a look at that. Okay. So let's move on to something really quickly. This is really an application of what we've been seeing in the past few videos. We looked at osteoblasts, which are the cells that build bone by building collagen. They, they also build the hydroxyapatite. And then we went to the next type of cell, which was the osteoclast. And that's the type of cell that actually degrades the bone. And one of the important things to realize about the dynamic between osteoblasts and osteoclasts is it's not like you just build bone 
and it just sits there. Okay, bone is actually very unintuitively a very metabolically active tissue. So you constantly have bone being built and bone being taken away. And really what it's about is it's about what happens more. You know, for example, if the rate of protein building by osteoblasts exceeds the rate of protein degradation by osteoclasts, then what you have is net protein and bone growth. And so that means you're going to have an increased bone mineral density, right? But let's say, for example, that you have an, a higher rate of bone resorption by the osteoclasts. Well, in that case, that means you have net bone destruction. And that can be the case in certain homeostatic imbalances like in osteopenia and osteoporosis. But what we're going to find is that one good way to counteract bone loss is to actually exercise like this woman is doing here in the picture. And this is actually um, a pretty famous woman in the exercise community. This is Pauline Norden. Pauline Norden is a great example of a female bodybuilder who definitely is not one of those that you typically see on steroids. This woman did it all naturally. And basically what she's applying to get the kind of natural muscle that she has is she's applying the principle called Wolf's Law. And Wolf's Law is a pretty simplistic law. It's, not, it's certainly not based on any of those really complicated physical um, parameters that you have in like quantum mechanics, certainly. But all it says is basically if you apply a physical stressor chronically onto the bone, i.e. resistance training, like these weights right here. So if you lift weights, if you apply a stress to the bone, the bone will physiologically adapt to counter the loads being placed on it. Okay, this is very similar to what you see in muscle, which we haven't gotten to yet. I think we all have the intuition that if you put chronic uh, resistant stressors on the muscle, they will hypertrophy. The muscles will get bigger so that in the future they can counteract that load and be able to lift it. That's the basis of bodybuilding, like this woman is doing here. But what also happens is the bone hypertrophies. But it's not as if the bone is somehow getting, you know, it's not increasing in volume at all. It usually stays the same volume. It's actually increasing in density. So instead of becoming a larger volume, the bone is actually increasing in density. Density is usually abbreviated as rho, where rho is equal to the mass of the bone divided by the volume of the bone. So actually what you're doing is you're not really increasing the volume. You're actually increasing the density by increasing the mass of the bone. And so the way you increase the mass is, number one, you increase collagen synthesis. Okay, So if you, if you do lift lots of weights, the amount of collagen or the concentration that's in your bone actually goes up. Also, not only do you get collagen synthesis, but you get hydroxyapatite synthesis. So hydroxyapatite will actually increase. And specifically, when we, when we say, usually say an increase in bone mineral density, we're usually usually referring to the hydroxy appetite that increases okay so they actually say one of the ways to counteract osteoporosis is to lift weights is to do resistance training and so that will increase collagen and hydroxy appetite synthesis like she's doing here in the picture and the cells like we mentioned nothing new the cells that are going to be activated are going to be the osteoblasts and what it really is, is this activation on hormonal stimuli, which will be the topic of next week's lab, in at least the pre-lab. Okay, so if you have hormonal stimuli that get um, released during resistance training, they will activate the osteoblast, and so you'll get increases in collagen and hydroxyapatite synthesis. Okay, and one of the reasons that this happens is that the bone is actually trying to protect itself against the heavy loads that you're putting on it. And the, mu and the muscle is going to do a pretty similar thing, except it's actually the muscle that's lifting the weight. The bone actually doesn't lift any of the weight. The muscle actually pulls on the bone to lift the weight up. Okay, So it's actually directly the muscle that's actually lifting the weight. The bone is just trying to protect itself in any case. So the bone will increase in bone mineral density, which has to do with the hydroxyapatite, and increased collagen synthesis will ensue. Okay, And that's basically the idea behind Wolf's Law. Okay, which of the following conditions would elicit the greatest increase in bone mineral density and collagen concentration? Well, let's think about this. So calcium deficiency. Well, 
Calcium was an integral part of hydroxyapatite, right? If we look at the molecular formula, it's Ca10, and then through stoichiometry, we, for 10 calciums, we have six phosphates, and then we should have two hydroxides. So that's the formula for hydroxyapatite. You can see that it requires calcium. So actually, if we actually drop the calcium, if we have a drop in calcium, we actually drop the hydroxyapatite. And that's not what we want, because if we have a calcium deficiency, you can't have much bone increase. You're actually going to get bone loss. Okay, So that's not the answer. Deficiency of enzyme in vitamin D synthesis. Well, I haven't really told you yet, but vitamin D is it, it's a it's a hormone that essentially is required for calcium calcium absorption at the gut you'll talk more about that when you get into a and p2 when you do the digestive system but suffice it to say if you want to absorb significant amounts of calcium from the intestine from the diet you actually have to absorb it and vitamin d promotes that what about weightlifting I think we have an intuition now that weightlifting is going to uh, satisfy Wolf's Law. And so we're going to get increased bone mineral density and collagen synthesis when we do weightlifting. And watching TV, well, unless you're on a treadmill, but even treadmills don't even, you're not doing resistance training on a treadmill. So even watching TV is not going to do anything. In fact, watching TV, they've shown, is actually bad for you. Okay, because usually when people watch TV, they are sitting sedentary, basically on their butt, and they're not doing any kind of resistance training. They're just being lazy. And so, you know, people are typically eating when they're doing this and so forth. So they're gaining weight, which isn't good, and they're not certainly not being active. Okay, so the key is if you want to build bone, you have to have a, a decent diet. You have to have plenty of amino acids. You have to have plenty of calcium, and then you theoretically should... Um, be synthesizing a lot of vitamin D, which requires energy to do. In fact, the synthesis of vitamin D, I'll go ahead and mention it, requires acetyl-CoA. We mentioned about that. That was um, part of beta oxidation. It's one of the products. So you actually have to have a lot of acetyl-CoA to make vitamin D because vitamin D comes from 7-dehydrocholesterol, which is um, it's, it's part of a downstream pathway that starts with acetyl-CoA. So you have to have energy, you have to have amino acids, you have to have calcium. And one other important thing that I'll mention about this is you want to avoid inflammation. I haven't mentioned it at this point, but when you have inflammation, inflammation is what we call something that is that promotes cortisol release. Okay, so when you have chronic, let me write that, when you have chronic inflammation, what you actually see is an increased cortisol synthesis. And actually, the reason that this happens is you're getting an increase in the enzymes that synthesize cortisol, so you get an increase in cortisol. Cortisol has a nasty effect. Okay, what cortisol does is it inhibits, it inhibits collagen synthesis. Okay, so one of the uh, things that is important is one of the things that causes chronic inflammation is dairy. It's, it's actually coming out now that dairy promotes chronic inflammation, particularly because of one of the proteins that's in there, also referred to as casein. Casein in its full form, which you find in dairy, is not exactly the greatest thing. It's known to be a carcinogen, and it promotes chronic inflammation, which leads to increased cortisol synthesis, and cortisol inhibits collagen synthesis. So one of the reasons that... Um, bones fracture as you get older is because you're eating these most of the people that age are eating all these inflammatory foods inflammation inhibits collagen synthesis indirectly and so if they lose collagen then they're more likely to fracture and we talked about that in some of the previous videos so let's go on to the next thing for wolf's law to be applied to a human system which of the following cells would have to become more active to increase bone mineral density well what did we talk about that builds bone well, the cell that builds bone is the blast. B for build, B for blast. So it's the osteoblast. Okay, Osteoclasts, these are cells that we talked about catabolize bone. Chondroblasts don't have to do with anything directly here. Chondroblasts, they're actually cells that synthesize the matrix of cartilage. So when you actually see this prefix of chondro, this is for cartilage. Okay. And blast in general means build. So these are builders of cartilage tissue. Okay, so if you have hyaline cartilage, fibril cartilage, elastic cartilage in general, they're going to have a lot of chondroblasts. But osteoblasts specifically build bone. Okay, 
And basically what's going to happen in the next week, not this week, we're going to talk about some of the regulation of hydroxyapatite synthesis. So we're going to talk about all sorts of hormones and stuff like that. So hopefully this video gave you a little bit of intuition on osteoclasts and a few applications with Wolf's Law. See you in the next video.